All right, Michelle, I think that was twice. Or... Yep. Okay, very good. Well, good morning uh, to you all <laughs> uh, in Washington. Um, my name is Valerie Davis, and I'm with the Resource Sharing Project and the Iowa Coalition Against Sexual Assault. And it is afternoon for me and I believe Carla in Pennsylvania as well. And so I just wanted to say it's so exciting to be able to visit with you today about uh, some uh, strategies, if you will, for building strong foundations um, that are going to support uh, sexual assault services. That we learn. Oh, I forgot. Let's do some poll questions first. So, if you could answer the poll, what does your agency do? We just want to get a sense of who's with us today. And while you're answering the poll, Carla, do you want to go ahead and um, introduce yourself? Sure. Ah, uh, good after morning. Everyone, I know we just covered that. <laughs> um, my name is Carla Vierteller. I am the Advoca Advocacy and Resources Director at the National Sexual Violence Resource Center, and I'm very excited to be with you all. I was getting ahead of myself. I'm going to just jump right in, and I forgot that we had wanted to find out who's with us. So it looks like most uh, the overwhelming majority of folks are uh, from dual programs, which is fantastic because that is uh, the bulk of the audience that I'm used to talking to about um, this topic. So could you all then also answer, take the poll, um, and let us know what your uh, role is at your agency. And of course, there's lots of us that wear more than one hat, so you could also, if you wanted to, uh, type in the chat box if you wear multiple hats. So it does look like, again, that we have a, well, actually a really good breakdown um, of uh, executive directors, program managers, and advocates, and again, a whole lot of people who said um, that they do other things. So that's great. What we're going to focus on today is really around leadership and leading through organizational change, which I think applies to across the board, no matter what your role is in your agency. We all have roles in uh, taking leadership around organizational change. So thank you for taking our poll. And uh, like Michelle said, oh, I'm just flipping all over the place. Um, like Michelle said, please don't hesitate to uh, ask any questions that you have in the chat box. Um, I can't see all of your beautiful faces, so I don't know if you have a question. I'm going to try and stop and ask for questions as well, but please just go ahead and type it in and we'll be monitoring that and try and answer as we go. Um, and so I want to uh, get us started today on our content. And um, Carla and I are here to talk about some of the lessons and uh, strategies, like I said earlier, that we learned through the Sexual Assault Demonstration Initiative. And the Sexual Assault Demonstration Initiative, or uh, what we mostly refer to as the SADI, was a multi-year project designed to enhance services in dual and multi-service agencies um, for survivors of sexual violence. And uh, an important principle or concept um, that, or foundation that we used was that the only way to really enhance services and sustain those services was through organizational change rather than solely focusing on programmatic change. And we did both things in the SAVI. Um, by programmatic change, I mean things like which services are going to be delivered or how to deliver services. Um, but mostly we concentrated on organizational change, such as uh, policies and procedures, staffing patterns, um, organizational culture, training, um, those types of things. And we learned many things over the years um, but two of the primary lessons um, that we learned about what it takes to have successful organizational change 
to create meaningful services for survivors of sexual violence is that it first requires programs to acknowledge that survivors aren't getting what they deserve from us. And that's not a, an attack on dual programs or ourselves as individuals. Um, I come from my, before I started this work um, as a technical assistance provider, my entire 15 year career before that was in a dual program and a director of the program. Um, and so it's not an attack, it's just sort of like that thing like we, we haven't been doing what we need to do uh, to really reach and serve survivors of sexual violence and so we have to acknowledge that. Um, and then what we have to do is we have to be open to more fundamental and organizational changes than, again, just making tweaks to existing services. And so that was really um, some of the overarching things that we learned in the SADI about what it's going to take, again, to have meaningful services for survivors of sexual violence um, is going to be through organizational change. Um, and again, the Carla, if you have anything that you want to add, just go ahead and jump in at any time, okay? Okay, thanks, Val. One of the things I wanted to then also just uh, touch on a little bit is individual change versus organizational change. And often we focus on individual change. Like we train individual advocates for how to do their jobs, right? And we go to trainings ourselves, right? And we might have those aha moments. And we ourselves then take that training and those things that we've learned um, back to our organization to use it in our own practice. Again, whether we're an, an advocate serving survivors or as a manager or a director supervising staff. Um, like that's individual change. And while Individual change can certainly inspire organizational change. It doesn't mean organizational change. Um, organizational change happens when we institutionalize it into our organization, when we work together um, as a whole to make the way that the organization operates uh, to be different. Um, and I think perhaps in Washington as across the nation, turnover in our field is huge. Um, and so when we only focus on individual change or the way individuals operate in our work, as then folks leave and then new folks start over, that change that we wanted to see doesn't fit, right? It's not sustainable. Um, and so again, we need, individual change, again, can inspire organizational change, but organizational change needs us working together as an organization to institutionalize it. And the other thing that you know, we learned in the SADI, and I think is true just probably in, in uh, organizational change research and literature, is that change that happens quickly um, is usually cosmetic and temporary. That happens when we're like really excited and we have energy and it's really focused, uh, again, on that individual change. Um, but real meaningful change comes after time and after really processing um, what the changes really mean. Because, again, in organizational change, some of the things that we are, are asking of programs um, in this organizational change process for enhancing services um, for survivors of sexual violence is like to really uh, reconsider your organizational identity, right? The mission of your organization. Is it inclusive and really like meaningful um, to survivors of sexual violence? Is how you operate and um, engage with survivors uh, more focused on how you uh, operate and engage with domestic violence survivors, such as offering shelter and protection order assistance, um, but no other uh, opportunities that are more meaningful to perhaps sexual violence survivors. So, like, again, it really, like, takes a lot of time and talking and working through and self-reflection um, to make that change happen. And so... Um, I put up here this organizational change process, 
and I wanted to just um, walk through this a little bit. And again, please ask questions in the chat if anyone has questions. Um, and as I walk through this organizational change process. So uh, again, a lot of times when uh, programs are going to engage um, in a new change effort, like we're going to really focus on hand, uh, sexual assault services. And we know that we haven't you know, maybe been doing the best that we could um, for sexual violence survivors. And so we're excited about this. And we have a lot of energy. And that's where you know, a lot of this starts. Um, and then during that energy time, a lot of times programs are um, focused on keeping up appearances. Maybe they don't ask for help um, about doing this because they don't want to acknowledge maybe outside of their organization that perhaps um, they haven't been doing as good a job for survivors of sexual violence as they would like to. Um, so they want to keep up those appearances, like we've got it all together. Like we don't need any help, um, that type of attitude, right? And so what we know, though, about organizational change is that no matter what, and what we learned in the SADI, and again, just in the understanding about what it takes to change organizations, is that there's going to be a period of destabilization. Um, and again, the nature and the degree of the destabilization is going to be different and varied across, you know, all the um, across organizations. It's not going to look the same in every program, right? Because um, every program is perhaps starting in a different uh, spot, depending upon the size of the organization, the uh, experiences of past organizational trauma and how that was worked through or not worked through, um, the leadership structure, whether or not there's been a change in leadership recently, like those types of things like are all going to contribute to how the destabilization manifests. Um, but I know that sometimes that sounds really scary to folks and they're like, I don't want to rock the boat. Like, I just want to like make these changes, but I don't want to change anything, right? We don't want to mix things up. And really what, what has to happen, like really to make these like really fundamental, like again, your organizational identity um, changes, it's going to cause like folks to question things, right? And to be unsure and to be like, I've been doing this work for over 20 years and you're now telling me that maybe that hasn't been the way to do the work. And so we question ourselves, right? And so what can happen and what needs to happen during destabilization in order to come out, the, 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 to come out of destabilization in a way that creates meaningful change and creates a healthy and vibrant organization um, is honest self-reflection. Um, that ability to take a step back, see where our gaps are, see where our strengths are, and build on those strengths in order to address those gaps. Um, that's then when, again, we can have the restabilization, a renewed energy again, and then really working on meaningful change. What happens uh, sometimes is programs get caught up in the destabilization, um, either because they just want to stick with keeping up appearances, not asking for help, not uh, being able to acknowledge themselves that they need help, um, support from maybe like their coalition or tech other technical assistance providers. And so then they disengage. Or worse, uh, more uh, organizational trauma happens. Does that sort of make sense for folks? You can answer in the chat box if this is sort of resonating and makes sense for you, or if there's things that need clarifying, I'd be happy to do that. Oh, it looks like someone might have raised their hand, but then put their hands up. Um, I don't see any hands raised, and I don't see anything in the chat box other than um, just some different connection issues, which I'm going to um, try to help with. Yeah. When I see Michelle Evelyn 
just um, asked, will we speak more about self-reflection and how to go about that? Well, actually, that's exactly where the rest of our um, webinar is really going to go today, is about leadership and uh, some of those uh, facilitating structures to be able to have that self-reflection and to lead organizations through then this organizational change um, to come out um, uh, the, to come out of the process in a uh, position to really have that meaningful, sustained change um, and have a healthy organization. Um, so again, I just want to say, so those programs, uh, when programs have leadership that embraces uh, the opportunity to slow down, pause, reflect, assess and plan, they are the ones that are going to be in the best position to make meaningful change. The ones that have stable leadership, again, I would never encourage an organization to take on any of this type of work if there was going to be or recently was a change in executive leadership, um, that that is just too much of a change in and of itself to then also then start in on this Again, where we're really like uh, looking at our organizational identity and the way in which we um, provide uh, services to survivors of sexual violence. And it really requires empowering leadership. And so those are the things that we're going to focus on um, throughout the rest of our webinar here. So <clears throat> there are many types of leadership that are effective and can be uh, empowering and stable. Um, but what we know is absolutely effective um, leadership needs to embrace a more pluralistic approach instead of a unitary approach. And so what I mean by unitary approach is one is where um, the authority in the organization is really held by one leader and that um, everybody else is sort of a subordinate to that particular person, um, that the culture of the organization is based on that leader's right to manage and staff have little autonomy in their job. Um, unitary approaches to leadership um, is where conflict is seen as problematic and the leaders try to eliminate any sort of conflict or suppress any sort of conflict. And that when they're faced with conflict, um, leaders are, again, either going to maybe ignore it and avoid it or sort of engage in competition, again, to reassert their authority. Um, again, the decision-making mostly rests with that executive administrator. So what we would encourage, again, for meaningful organizational change to happen is that we really need to have more of a pluralistic approach to organizational leadership. Um, these leaders set a tone and create a culture of learning in the organization. They recognize multiple interests. They recognize and encourage conflict and various sources of power that can shape the organization. And again, the defining characteristic of leaders who use a pluralistic approach is that they balance and coordinate different interests among the staff to work together to achieve the organization's goals. So again, they create sort of like this culture of learning. Um, so, and learning organizations are ones that are able to engage in uh, what we call double loop learning. And what that really means is there's single loop learning and double loop learning. And double loop learning just has it, the extra step basically that I think of as self-reflection, being able to uh, challenge yourself about what you've always thought and believed. So learning, like we scan the environment, um, we check, maybe do you know, service evaluations, we do a community assessment, we have a technical assistance provider come in and say, here's what we see about your organization, whatever, like right, we gather information from the environment. Um, and then the next step is that we compare that information with what we believe 
internally, right? What are those organizational norms? And in single loop learning, we then just take action from that. Where in the double loop learning, in learning organizations, we take what we've taken from the, the organizational sort of like environment scan, we match that up and contrast it with what we believe, and then we reflect on that, we question the norms, we're self-reflective, and then maybe we revise the norms, what we believe, what we understand to be true, and then we take action. And so in order to do that, that means that leaders are, need to embrace change, which is, you know, again, always scary, right? We don't want to mix things up. We've got too many things going on. Um, but it really is about embracing change as a way to grow and to do better for survivors of sexual violence. Um, we expect and then welcome those challenges. We're able to learn from our mistakes. So um, there's um, I was trying to think about how we phrased this when we worked with uh, uh, project sites during the demonstration initiative. It was something like being able to be willing to experiment, take risks and experiment and try things, see what works, and then so do test piloting a little bit um, there, um, so that see, try something. Don't be afraid to try it. Then you can assess it, see what works, see what didn't work, and then always continually grow and evolving things um, is what we're asking. Hey, Val. Oh, to do. Absolutely, Michelle. Um, just listening to you talk about, you know, how organizations are, um, you know, best prepared to, to be able to engage in, in learning and in organizational change, there's so many parallels here with what mitigates also mitigates um, organizational trauma uh, and things like that. So there's so many other benefits as well, and I don't know if this is something that that you plan to, to touch on as well. It's just really sticking out to me when I when I talk about organizational trauma that that all of these things are are, are leadership skills that help your organization really mitigate organizational trauma and also make you more resilient as an organization. Absolutely. So, and because <clears throat> what we're talking about are exactly what you're saying, Michelle, just basic good leadership skills to begin with. Um, and then knowing that within our organization, within our field, there is so much organizational trauma that has occurred in the past, is occurring currently, and being um, dealt with in um, a variety of different ways, not all of which mitigate. Um, organizational trauma, using these skills will. So then you add in this effort to do organizational change, um, absolutely just needing to enhance those skills even that much more. Um, the other thing that I was thinking of um, about learning organizations is, again, it's this willingness and being open to learning um, sometimes programs, especially in that keeping up appearances, sort of spot and get stuck in that, or maybe um, for a variety of different reasons in their community, they can never really be vulnerable, right? Because we're perhaps searching, always grounding around for money, um, competing with other programs in our community for money, that we always have to put up a really good front right, and say, we've got this. We know what we're doing. We're the experts in our community. Um, and so it really takes this real vulnerability um, to, to say, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> Maybe that isn't the case. And to actually then reach out for help in order to um, turn that around. And so again, it, it really takes that openness to learning, openness to change. And so what we learned in the study as well is that, again, organizations that were able to accomplish the most changes, the most comprehensive and sustainable, meaningful changes were led by people who demonstrated trust in and empowerment of their staff. And again, what we're talking about is not necessarily um, 
having individual trust amongst staff people or amongst like the leader and you trust like this particular person. It's a culture of trust in the organization where staff feel trusted by their agency leadership. And when staff feel trusted by their agency leadership, they're able to have more confidence, more job satisfaction, and perform their job better, which is what sexual violence survivors need and deserve, right? It's advocates who feel good in their job um, and then are competent um, and confident in their job. And so we're going to talk through the rest of the webinar about, again, some of those processes or structures um, that programs are going to want to put in place in order to support uh, having stable and empowering leadership. Great. Thank you, Val. That was wonderful. Um, so this is Carla, and I'm going to sort of go through these processes and structures with you all today. Um, and we selected five. Um, I think there were many more <laughs> that we found from the Sadie Project, um, but these felt like um, sort of key concepts to pull out and share with you today. Um, so I think the first for us that came out was having an actively anti-oppressive approach to doing the work of sexual violence. Um, we all know that we cannot end sexual violence without ending oppression of all people. Um, we know that oppression is inextricably linked to our work. Um, and yet we also know that sometimes that isn't very clear in sort of the structure of how our organizations are set up um, and how we talk about our issue. Um, so really pulling that out and bringing that to the forefront of all the work that we do um, in sexual violence services is very key. Um, in the Sadie, we found that strong programs have an understanding and direct response to racism and oppression. So not just sort of talking about it um, in a staff meeting or amongst each other, but having a, a strong response when something happens in the community. Um, because I think in our movement, we've always been linked to um, other forms of activism around racism and oppression uh, throughout the years, but I think that that connection has become less and less clear. Um, and so I think it's our role as sexual violence programs to really lift that up and talk about it more frequently within our community, within our programs, um, to, to keep bringing that to the forefront um, of the work that we're doing. And we know that that kind of commitment to racial justice really needs to come from leadership uh, because staff can do the work and, ha and have those conversations and bring that to everything they're doing from training to community involvement. But if there isn't that kind of agency-wide lens that's been adopted, their policies, decision-making, um, it just doesn't kind of infiltrate the whole agency and it's much more difficult then to change the culture of the agency. Absolutely, Carla. And I was just going to add, if, if I could, and maybe you were going to go here. Um, I was just going to say that one of the ways um, that stable and empowering leadership and having this anti-racism, anti-oppression lens or approach is for people in leadership to have the ability to share power um, or to change the ways in which power has been used in the past within the organization. Um, and that they show a commitment to ensuring that people of color have positions of power within the agency. I think those are really concrete um, and absolutely necessary things uh, for programs to have that anti-oppressive, anti-racism um, approach. Yeah. Thank you. You said that better than <laughs> I, was, I would have. Okay. So next we're going to talk about trust building. Um, and that's a fascinating word. It's um, uh, our statements. It's really about kind of how do you create a culture and an agency of trust from leadership on. And although trust building sort of sounds like a therapist's word, a better way to look at it is to look at and engage in behaviors that enable empowerment, innovation, work, great work, stable results, and good working relationships. Um, so really creating an environment um, and a model 
of how to build trust uh, within staff. So part of that is to trust your staff. Always assume the best. Always assume and understand, always assume the best and understand that your staff are brilliant individuals with lots to contribute and that you're lucky to have them on board. And working within that assumption can really help change the idea of, of how the agency works and how staff view themselves based on how they are treated. Um, another comment around trust building. Um, the other thing is, is looking at your behavior and how your behavior builds trust within the agency. So do you show up? Do you show up to difficult conversations um, that, that are optional for staff? Are you responsive? Do you respond to email quickly when somebody needs something from you? Um, do you offer kind of assistance and guidance for someone who may not know what to do? Um, when submitting a report or doing a press release or really anything in their role? Um, and do you own your own stuff? Are you honest about when you mess up, uh, which we all do, but sort of being as transparent as possible and hu as human as possible, um, but at the same time showing up as your best self every day to work, um, and having high expectations for yourself, and thus, ha uh, thus having high expectations for others, but sort of being human in those, in those approaches to, to high expectations. Val, do you have any additions there? Well, I was just thinking about, and you said it so nicely about, um, like, it, one of the key ways to build trust as a leader amongst your staff is that ability to be self-reflective. Right, and to accept feedback, um, you know, request feedback and accept feedback, um, whether that's from your staff or your community members or your board of directors or your tribal council or technical assistance providers, right? This open, like you're open to getting feedback and then using that feedback in a constructive way that's, um, again, not then. Um, there's no negative consequences for someone to have given you that feedback. Um, mm -hmm. That is so huge. Um, so I think we said it. So again, that self-reflection is, is key. Yeah, yeah. And I think that self-reflection, being able to do that yourself, uh, and being open in that, whether you're doing that as a um, as a team learning approach, let's for example talk about uh, anti-racist work. So perhaps you're doing a voluntary meeting around um, how to create um, a uh, a more equitable workspace. Just being able to bring your full self to that conversation and and being as honest as is ethically possible. Um, really creates an environment where your staff will feel comfortable doing that as well. Mm -hmm. And Carla, I see a question in the chat about it says, how do you help build trust in an organization that has years of a habit of not trusting each other? Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of us that have uh, had that experience and struggle with that question. Um, Carla, did is there something that you want to say about that? Well, I think I would repeat what you had to say. It just takes time. I think you just start employing these techniques, uh, and hopefully leadership is committed to that. And then, and just like tr building trust in any other relationship, it just takes time. And you just keep showing up and doing the work. Um, but I'm sure you have more to add, Val. Well, I think one of the keys, and this comes from my um, ways to, like Michelle brought up earlier, mitigate organizational trauma, so trying to um, prevent organizational trauma or when it has happened, um, being able to mitigate that and help uh, navigate uh, through organizational trauma is when we have to name that. We have to be willing to say to ourselves and to each other, that this is a problem. Trust is a problem in our organization. Um, and that is where it needs to start. And then uh, identify what is going, what are we going to do together as a team 
what needs to happen in order for us to start trusting each other. Um, and some of those things are the things that we're talking about um, and that, Carla, you're going to spend a little bit more time on, like direct and ethical communication, um, being anti-racist, um, being able to, you know, ask uh, and sort of like surface conflicts that are happening. But, you know, really we have to be able to name it and converse with each other and say, this, I don't trust you. Or, you know, I was thinking about a meeting that I had with a program with their leadership team. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about, um, well, really it was about organizational trauma. But they were wanting to learn more about how to do trauma-informed supervision. We were having this conversation. Mm -hmm. And I'm sort of like sitting back and I put some questions out for conversation and watching the ways that the leadership team was interacting with each other. And it was clear to me that they didn't, that the people on the leadership team did not trust each other. And it kept manifesting as well in how they talked about staff and how they talked about how staff don't trust them um, and how they don't trust staff. And so finally, I said to them, it looks to me like you all don't trust each other. So you're never going to resolve this issue of staff not trusting you, you not trusting staff, if you amongst the leadership team don't trust each other. Does that resonate for you all? And they were sort of like, some people were sort of like, oh, I ain't saying that. And other people were like, yes, we, there is issues of trust amongst our team. Um, and so starting to name um, what those specific issues are and then identifying steps to uh, address that and build the team within that, uh, build the trust within that leadership team is what needed to happen. Um, and so, and then seeking outside support because I'm guessing if there is um, a culture of not trust throughout the organization for years. There's been a lot of organizational trauma that has happened that needs to be worked through as well. And so seeking outside support for working through that would be the other thing that I would suggest. Val, we have another question. Okay. Um, how does how does external organizational assessment factor into real change and questionable outcomes of organizational effect, such as annual reports, et cetera? I'm trying to think what the question is asking. Um, so, how does so? This is how this is. I don't know if this is going to answer the question or not. So, um, Elaine can re-ask the question if I don't answer it correctly, or Carla, if you um, if we both don't answer it the way that um, the question is asked. But so this is how I think about. Um, engaging in effective organizational change um, for services for survivors of sexual violence is one, we have to do this sort of like internal organizational assessment where we look at our mission statement, our staffing structures, our policies and our procedures, our marketing materials, the services that we provide, the approach that we're using to provide services, the way in which we treat and support our staff. Like we need to do that internal assessment um, because all of those then impact our ability to provide effective trauma-informed meaningful services to survivors of sexual violence. Doing that external scan is really important as well in developing your plan for how you're going to move forward and all the changes that need to be made is um, getting a sense from your community of what they know about your organization. How do they view your organization? Do they view your organization as a sexual assault services program? I know in our work in the SADI and then through other um, technical assistance projects, um, with rural grantees and then in, you know, Iowa and Pennsylvania as well, is a lot of times dual programs are seen in their community as domestic violence programs. And many folks, even community partners, don't necessarily see them as the sexual assault services program. Um, and so 
and their names aren't reflective, right? So survivors don't see them as the sexual assault services program. And so it's understanding what the community sees and knows about your organization, that what they see and know and understand about sexual violence will help you um, decide what messages you need to be sending about sexual violence. But then it also um, is what do they, you know, what does the community think survivors need? What are survivors asking for? And are you providing that? And so all of that will come through that external um, community type assessment to help then you decide what the changes are that need to be made. Um, so I'm not sure if that answers Elaine's question, but that's what I, what came to my mind. Oh, yep. Great. Yep. Okay. All right. We're going to move on to direct and ethical communication. And I feel like direct and ethical communication and then what we'll talk about next, conflict surfacing and resolution, both kind of play into trust building um, and are factors of trust building. Um, and so direct and ethical communication is, is sort of what you would think of. Um, it's definitely being ethical in your communication. I think one of the key factors of ethical communication is honesty. But that's not just, it's not just honesty. It's, it's being honest in all communications, but also being ethical. So keeping confidential information confidential not discussing situations such personal situations or um, just sharing things that wouldn't be appropriate in that conversation. Um, and it's also a way of respecting other people and what you share and respecting yourself in terms of how you communicate. Um, and one of the things that we've talked a lot about, Val and I, um, were, was um, – uh, and in the Sadie, is that so often um, in our rape crisis programs, in our dual programs, um, people that do really great advocacy work or community outreach <laughs> get promoted, which makes sense. You're doing great work, you get promoted, and there aren't a whole lot of leadership opportunities at our, at our programs. And so this person who has wonderf a wonderful set of skills in one thing is promoted to a leadership role. And part of that requires a whole different skill set, which we may or may not provide. Oftentimes we do not. So many times in our programs, we have leadership that has had no um, education or training on how to be an effective leader and how to engage in direct and ethical communication. And I think those are two very distinctive things. So we did talk about ethical communication, sort of being honest in, and appropriate with the information that you share. Um, but I think direct is also very important as a leader to say what you need to say, um, be comfortable in saying what you need to say to staff, because there's often very difficult situations that supervisors and leadership need to deal with. Um, and sometimes those, those uncomfortable conversations are difficult to have if you have no, no rain, nothing to pull from to know how to do that in an effective manner. And then sometimes when we're uncomfortable in situations, we may share too much, too little. We just aren't doing it perhaps in an ethical way because we feel so uncomfortable in a situation. Um, so really sitting with those skill sets learning more about them, processing them, and we do have a list of sort of, oh, here's a, a definition. Ethical communication enhances human worth and dignity by fostering truthfulness, fairness, responsibility, personal integrity, and respect for self and other. And I apologize for reading to you. That felt like a worthwhile thing to share. And then these are some ways to uh, practice direct and ethical communication. Um, but it is a skill set, and it's something that um, leadership managers should practice because it isn't something that comes naturally to us. Um, and I would say often, too, often women are in positions of leadership and we are not taught. Many of us are not taught um, how to engage in direct uh, communication. Hey, Carla. Yeah. <clears throat> Michelle here. 
Um, one of the things that I'm thinking about with direct and ethical communication, which I'm a huge uh, fan of, especially just from learning more about the SADI and being a part of it myself, and also just um, doing a lot of um, external organizational consultation nationally, um, that I think that it's it so builds upon that trust building piece that you're talking about, right? That helps to when you know your boss is going to be direct. Um, and is always going to tell you you're not always worried about what they might be thinking or if you might be getting fired or do you know what I mean? Like there's that piece that creates some more safety that allows that trust building to happen. Um, so I've really seen this be, be such a powerful tool for, for leaders and for organizations that are dealing with organizational trauma, that are dealing with vicarious trauma, that are dealing with uh, a lot of organizational change or turnover, that just that open communication, that direct communication is such a useful tool and so important for us to focus on. Yep. Thank you, Michelle. That's definitely, definitely true. And I think the other thing, I know I focused on potentially conflict, um, which we will talk about next, but I think also as a supervisor, if you share the positives, of what somebody is doing directly, then they have a very real uh, understanding of, of where they stand and what they're doing well and what they're not and where they need to grow, which I think everybody wants. You want to know how you're doing, how you can, both how you can improve and what you're doing well. Um, and I think oftentimes since some of the, the, com the conflict is difficult to go into, we just sort of say, oh, this is great, but people don't really have a strong understanding of, of why it's great, what they're exceptional at, things like that. So really kind mm -hmm. of pulling out those kind of conversations. Yeah, and, and I would add to that, Michelle and Carla, um, is you know, having supervision and normalizing, normalizing supervision and normalizing conversations about you know, our performance, things that we do really well at work and things that we're struggling with, and normalize that through regular supervision um, really then creates that sense of trust and learning culture. Um, and like you're saying, Michelle, you're not always fired, or you're not always worried that you're going to get fired the only time your boss ever talks to you is when there's a problem, right? Um, and so I think that when we offer supervision, um, which I have learned uh, when I was um, working at a program, but then also um, doing national technical assistance is not something that's offered on a regular basis a lot or at all in many, many programs. Um, except for maybe that administrative type supervision where we're like, did you get your contact sheets in on time? Did you get your time sheets in on time? Um, you were three minutes late to work. Like all of like that sort of um, supervision that's pro provided, but not more of the supervision about like, hey, how are you doing? Um, tell me about some of the challenges that you're having. Tell me about the things that you feel good about. Here's what I see. Um, and really doing that in a trauma-informed way, um, again, goes a long way with um, creating trust in the organization. Yeah. Great. And I, Thank I was going to just say, Carla, if, unless you were going to talk a little bit more about some of the things on the slide. Um, no, please. I think it's really important, um, number one, that we start with goodwill and loving kindness. Um, that is, like, so huge in our work. And I even know for myself, sometimes I get – Right, frustrated or tired, and I interact with someone, and I don't start from that place of loving kindness. I start from my place of being tired or frustrated or overworked and overwhelmed. Um, and so always uh, wanting to remember to take a step back and to start then with that loving kindness place. I know that the biggest, in, in my own self-reflection about um, my leadership and supervision are the, uh, the times where I um, know that I did not uh, perform at my best were always those times when I started from a place of frustration, being overwhelmed, being tired, hurrying, uh, and not taking that time to pause and reflect and start from loving kindness. Um, and number two, you know, I don't know how many folks um, on the webinar have been around for a really long time, um, but I know that I have been 
doing this work for, you know, over 20 years, and I sometimes find myself, um, you know, seeking new ideas from, you know, all the new and young folks that are coming into our work, and then they'll say, hey, how about we try this? And I'm always like, no, or sometimes I find myself like saying, no, we tried that in 1997, and it didn't work for all of these multiple reasons, right? Or we've tried, you know, those things so many times, and it hasn't worked. Um, so to have a, to stop, you know, that cycle of saying, no, that won't work, we tried that, uh, is to say, hey, let's find ways to make that work. That sounds like a wonderful idea. What are some ways that we could make that work or see about making that work? Um, and then I also think one of the biggest um, challenges that we have around direct and ethical communication um, in our work in particular sometimes is number six, um, depersonalizing um, things, because this is deeply personal work for all of us, um, for most of us whether we are also survivors, as well as advocates and directors and leaders of programs. But right, we're dealing with personal trauma day in and day out, so it is um, personal work and we take pride in our work. And so sometimes that makes us, or um, we get into spots where we, again, personalize the issue that we're having with someone instead of needing to take, again, that step back and make it not about the person, but about the work. Um, and so that will help us, again, always come from that place of loving kindness, being able to be direct and say what needs to be said, um, but then remain ethical, right? That we're not doing personal attacks, um, those types of things. Thanks, Val. Mm So we're going to now talk about conflict surfacing and resolution. Um, and conflict surfacing is sort of the approach that conflict is not hidden, that it's sort of dealt with when it surfaces and it's not something to sort of hide or not talk through. It's something where we are open and honest about the fact that we have conflict um, and we're open and honest uh, about how we resolve that conflict. Um, so and it's so it's being honest about it, but it's also sort of showing how and mirroring and also modeling is the word I was mm -hmm. looking for <laughs> healthy conflict and resolution. Um, and one of the the pieces that kind of continues to resonate with me is is that assertiveness does not equal aggressiveness. So becoming comfortable, and that goes back to our ethical communication, becoming comfortable in talking about what may not be working for you with something, becoming comfortable with giving feedback, which again may cause conflict, but then knowing and having the tools to be able to resolve the conflict. Um, so I think, and I think that goes back a lot to those being comfortable with having difficult conversations um, mm -hmm. and being willing to sort of jump into them as well because they're not, they're not going to be easy. Um, but the more comfort we have with sort of sitting with things um, and bringing up conversations that we may not be comfortable with, the, the farther we go and the more honest we are and in our communication, and the more we build trust. Um, and I think this kind of sitting with that discomfort relates directly to that anti-racism work. So I think yeah. both can sort of complement each other in an organization and really work to build that trust um, that, that we're real with each other in our organization, mm -hmm. that from leadership mm -hmm. down, we are able to have honest conversations and we're able to disagree with each other because that's normal. Um, but how we how we disagree and how we resolve those disagreements, even if it's agreeing to disagree, is so important to sort of that health and trust that would will exist within the organization. Well, Carla, if you don't mind, I I was thinking as you were talking that what it what I think about is um, like hopefully we've put together a diverse staff. Right, and that's diverse in a lot of different ways, racially and, and ethnically, um, you know, gender identification, but ideas as well, right? 
And so we don't want everybody feeling like everybody has to always think the exact same way about issues, right, or directions. Like we, we hopefully as leaders we've put together, like, right, we, because like, I always wanted to be able to find people who balanced me out or who had strengths uh, w that were the strengths that were my weaknesses, um, right, so that we all, like, really worked together as a team. And so that then meant, though, that folks didn't always have the same ideas about how to approach particular situations or directions for the program, those types of things. But, by, but that's what makes it great, right? That's what makes the end result, the decision, the action, even that much more powerful is when we can pull together uh, diverse groups of people hash that out and come up with a plan and not just one person's plan from one person's perspective. Um, it, it makes for a much stronger and sustainable then action. Great. Thanks, Val. Mm -hmm. And I missed a slide here. <laughs> um, so I think this is sort of what we shared already, that surfacing becomes a way of helping others view conflict as normal and a creative way of learning about diversity and difference. Um, it's great to create a culture where people feel safe and encouraged to hold each other accountable even when it's uncomfortable and having clear and well understood conflict resolutions in place um, help people raise issues in a safe way. So all of this, uh, we felt, comes down to training. Um, it feels like every single piece of these, all of these are not kind of innate behaviors that we have. Some of them are, but oftentimes we have, we have organizational trauma within our, within our, within our group. We have um, personal trauma. There's just a lot that has created a culture in organizations, um, and and. I'm, I don't feel like I know any organizations uh, and leadership who sort of have all of these down. Um, so that training piece is sort of so key. And as we were talking about learning organizations before, that really comes back to this. Training is an ongoing part of the work. It never is done. There is never a place where you've received all the training you will ever need. Um, and it's something that takes place from leadership down. So some is an agency-wide training, some is leadership training, some is for supervisors. It's just it's an all-engaging process uh, based on people's role and function. Um, but, there is, but it is essential to have training for management and leadership on sort of how, because the reality is that is who creates the culture within an organization. That's who sort of sets the tone um, and says whether or not we're, we might have these principles and beliefs, but leadership shows that we're going to commit to those in a very real way. Um, so those pieces need to be in place as well as training for the organization. Um, and we really wanted to pull out, obviously, the dismantling racism and oppression piece is huge. Also, ongoing work in many different ways. I know we personally at our organization, we do training on for, um, for white staff specifically on sort of learning around what it is, what white privilege is, um, how we can be, uh, how we can access ally behavior within the workplace, outside of the workplace, just sort of a, just sort of building up our skill set, and then we have all staff trainings where we talk through different things. Um, we have a group for staff of color um, where they create an action plan um, and talk through things. So it, it feels like a a dual purpose. So one, we have this sort of learning spaces, and then we have action spaces, but all sort of are, are leaning upon that sort of training to build up our skill set around dismantling racism and oppression internally and externally, um, but also talking about ethical communication, conflict resolution, um, staff expectations, uh, all will create a um, a different culture within your organization. Val, do you have any additions? 
around training or machine? Well, the, yeah, the only thing I was going to add, Carla, um, which doesn't necessarily have particular uh, – it's, it's more parallel uh, topic of training versus um, mm-hmm. our management training, um, but I'm going to plug, you know, training specific on, to sexual violence um, is key and crucial for, um, again, um, enhancing – and making meaningful services for survivors of sexual violence, for having a clear organizational identity, and for informing your policies and procedures that everyone on staff has a really good handle on the impact of sexual violence across the lifespan and throughout the healing journey. So often um, folks are trained and we have a focus on maybe that immediate crisis response to someone who has just recently experienced sexual violence. Um, and, and, and that's where it sort of stops. Or, uh, and a lot of times in dual programs, it's really around their understanding of intimate partner sexual violence as part of the domestic violence that is happening in people's lives. And so really wanting to have um, clear understanding about sexual violence, how that impacts survivors, again, across the lifespan, throughout the healing journey, that then can, inform, one, make for better advocates and better staff, but then also as a way to inform um, what you need to have for an organizational identity, policies and procedures, services, um, those types of things. So I was just going to put my plug in for that as usual. Val and Carla, do you see this question here from Sydney? What would be examples of clear processes for conflict resolution? Right now, I feel like we rely on each other's individual skill for conflict resolution and don't really have tools to lean on when someone is really struggling to handle conflict, take ownership of their actions, et cetera. Any resources that would be helpful to read up on this topic? And I um, will also say, my answer around a WixApp tool we have is the direct and ethical communication webinar um, that is uh, in the recorded webinar section of our website. But Val and Carla, do you have any resources that you'd like to share around that? Do you know of anything, Val? That's not where my head is at right now, so off the top of my head, like specific resources to refer someone to or specific yeah. strategies. Um, but I can certainly spend a little bit of time thinking about yep. it, Michelle, and then we can send it out to folks. You bet. Yep. And, and I see that Jody offered the book, um, Critical Conversations. Um, that is something that I know a lot of programs or a lot of people have been using um, yeah. lately. Um, but I definitely can spend a little time thinking about it. Um, I also think, and this is going to sound a little ridiculous, but I think Googling conflict resolution, I know I've done this in certain times, like when I've had to prepare for a different, a difficult conversation, um, but just sort of see what's out there. Because I think sometimes, well, we are not for-profit agency. We are not corporations. We're not businesses. Some of those tools, because there are so many of them, we could really we could take and adapt and see what might work for us and what m- might not work for us. And I think it's sort of telling that we're all sort of coming up blank because I this is not something I think our field has really paid a lot of attention attention to. Um, because I think we tend to avoid conflict. Um, so that would mm-hmm. be that would. Yeah. That would be sort of a suggestion, and maybe that's something your leadership team does, or maybe you have uh, like a you could have a um, accountability relationship with another manager in your in your workspace, and you two could spend like an hour a week and each find like five resources that you think would be helpful, and then sort of make them work for you. So take what you want from them, but then not not take what doesn't work within your agency, because certainly we aren't the hard and fast business organizations, but there are also some great tools about sort of holding people accountable and having difficult conversations. Oh, sanctuary mm-hmm. model. Mm-hmm. The other uh, thing that I was thinking, I just was thinking about, um, and not that I am, you know, the hugest fan or whatever, but I, I, 
I do think that there's some good things that a lot of people really love Brene Brown um, and really relate to her. So if you are in that category, there are things in her book. Um, uh, Braving the Wilderness is the new one that I was thinking of, but then I also think in the Daring Greatly book um, that there are some things um, in there that folks could use. I found a link uh, for impaired decisions and conflict management that I will put in the chat. Okay. All right, does anybody have any additional questions? This is Michelle. I um, uh, I just wanted to say, you know, uh, that I really appreciate sharing a lot of these aspects from the Sexual Assault Demonstration Initiative. Um, I was a part of it when I was at um, one of the demonstration sites, kind of initially before I came to Wix app, um, and it was just a really great experience as somebody who comes from a, a dual services background and was a manager in a in a dual service uh, provider. Um, that I really had wanted to, like I, I've known just since the beginning of my uh, kind of dual service career in, in 17 years ago, that I was not as prepared to do sexual assault services mm -hmm. as I was to do domestic violence services, and I felt really nervous about it for a long time. And then at some point really wanted to just strengthen those services and, and just really wanted to do a better job. Um, and so I really appreciate just the findings from this and really that connection to the management piece and, and what as leaders that we can do and how that affects how strong our advocates are in their advocacy and how strong the services that survivors are experiencing. And this, the project and a lot of things that came from it and my involvement in it really changed my work um, just really completely um, and I can't be um, grateful enough for, for the kind of information that it showed me. Um, about my own work and allowed me to be really reflective about um, how we do sexual assault services when we really need sometimes that economy of scale of having multiple programs in one like smaller rural community um, and things like that. So um, I just want to say that you know this work is, is so important that you all have done and, and I'm just really appreciative of, of sharing this kind of leadership lens to to creating those strong sexual assault services. I wonder if you have any kind of um, um, final comments about how, you know, how else you might see that leadership piece really directly connecting to those survivor services. Yeah. I can add something, Michelle. This is Val again. And, you know, we are just a few minutes out from our close, so, like, I could – talk for, you know, several more hours or so I'm going to say, I'm going to answer your question that then could be, you know, many more um, webinars or workshops. But I think for leaders, um, as part of stable and empowering leadership, one of the things that we learned in the Sadie is that how, how we support our staff has a direct connection to the services that survivors and the quality of um, services that survivors are getting from our organization, how well we support our staff. Um, and um, I know, and that means in so many things, like we talked about today, being um, direct and ethical in our communication and um, being empowering in our ideas and being creative with folks. Um, but it also is, you know, in you know, the, the benefits in the culture that we create, the benefits, um, like financial benefits um, for doing our work, but then in the culture um, that, we, that we set, the tone that we set about um, our work is really important. And where I was headed with this was that um, one of the things that we learned in the Sadie about how well we support our staff being directly connected to services for survivors was how we uh, 
treat or think about uh, advocates or people on staff, whether that's you know management positions or advocates um, who are also identifying as survivors. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that has that there's this um, huge stigma and has created barriers for folks um, in understanding sexual violence, but then in understanding how to be supportive because there's that stigma attached. And I know that for myself. Um, in my program, um, and I think what happens a lot of times in dual programs is that we have survivors on sex, survivors of sexual violence on staff who are deeply committed to doing sexual violence work, but are triggered every day in doing the sexual violence work, and then have nowhere to take that because our organization says uh, you all have to be fixed, you have to be perfect, you have to not talk about that here. Um, and so um, what happens then is that folks hold that in and they start focusing more and more on domestic violence services. And so it has a real impact, and that it was true for me um, in my organization. It was a lot easier for me um, emotionally as a human being to focus my energy on domestic violence than it was on sexual violence. And I've heard that time and time again from leaders across the country. And so I think that that is just something for us to, to think about is how our organizations support ourselves as survivors of sexual violence as well. And I rambled a little bit, and I apologize for that. about creating a workspace <clears throat> that, you know, welcomes all. Are there uh, folks who have questions more about, you know, kind of anything covered here or things that um, uh, even that have just come up that are maybe a little bit tangential? Feel free, we have a few minutes, so you can definitely ask um, whatever questions that are coming up for you. I know, that, Michelle, that there was a question earlier about um, doing sort of like a community assessment. Um, that toolkit is available um, on the links that you have on the screen right now. As well, so a, a, <clears throat> a toolkit to help uh, programs if they want to do um, a community assessment. And we will be um, within the next you know year or so being able to put um, a more concise toolkit around doing that organizational scan and organizational assessment as well on, on those links. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> There's another question in the chat. Would love to hear more or read more on survivors being activated by sexual assault advocacy. I see that pattern a lot here too, at by and for by survivors for survivors organizations. Seems like many people feel more comfortable turning toward and leaning into DB work and trying to avoid if they work when possible. I don't, I'm not sure I've really seen a lot. Oh, I see another comment. I also see SA survivors praying themselves into the SA advocacy because the love and care deeply and folks who don't identify as survivors of SA avoiding it and leaving a disproportionate amount of responsibility for the SA survivors. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah and I, I think that, you know, again, there are many strategies that programs um, can try um, to help normalize conversations about survivorship within their organization. Um, I know that that's a question that we're still exploring as well about what is useful and what isn't as useful, but it's certainly an issue with programs across the country 
Um, and so I think one of the ways, again, I go back to supervision, <laughs> having supervision, being trauma-informed about supervision, and normalizing conversations about survivorship. Again, whether that is because you are a survivor and you want to be able to acknowledge that, or you're a survivor and you, you know, it's perfectly acceptable for you not to disclose that, or for folks on our staff who aren't survivors, they have a lot of feelings that affect their work, too, about not being a survivor. And so being able to normalize and have those conversations and explore are so critical. Um, yeah, and so we will be putting out some more um, resources about that over the next year as well. But we're still trying to figure it out ourselves a little bit. We're just starting to have that conversation. And Val, this is Michelle. Um, yeah. Also, Sydney and, and just everybody, you know, I, I, this, of course, is something that, that I've noticed um, over time as well, and really thinking about one of the things that I discovered from uh, being a part of the Sexual Assault Demonstration Initiative was that when I, when I did my community assessment and talked with survivors about what helped them heal, there was so, the majority of them really talking about being a part of this movement or doing something and really engaging in that the meaning making healing part of um, of um, their recovery, their coping. Um, and so many survivors um, trying to make meaning or make better a situation from the trauma that they've experienced, like engaging in this movement, speaking out, um, a writing letter to the editor, but really a lot of it, volunteering and working in this field. So many of us are survivors, and it's just a conversation that we have to just be really having openly that so many of us are coming into this field to do a lot of meaning making um, and also to do a lot of prevention work to try to, to end the experiences that, that we have had um, from happening to, to generations to come. So it's such a core aspect of how survivors heal and also how our movement works. Um, mm -hmm. And it really, you know, it is really nuanced, the, the dynamics within that. And really, um, I can't, you know, impress enough about the importance of having those one-on-one -on -one, um, times for supervision, where as a supervisor, you can really help staff to work through these things. Um, and also, you know, holding, at the same time, holding the responsibility for having a dual service program saying, we do both of these things and do we have staff who are in the right places for those? Because some people want to make meaning from their situation by doing some work that's a little bit removed, like sexual assault survivors who want to do domestic violence work or vice versa, you know, or that are child sexual abuse survivors and feel more comfortable working with adults or, you know, vice versa, those kind of things. And so we really have to make sure that we're operating on that informed consent when people know who our organization is when they come into work there. Because that's, I think, a lot of the, the struggle that folks have had is that with that organizational change is that they, they thought they were just coming to work at a DV shelter. Right. And that the sexual assault components just weren't clear to the community at large of which future employees are a part, right? So... Um, I feel like that's another challenge with that change is that we have to be really honest about who we are and what we do and really clear about that things, not just for survivors who are coming to access our services, but also for those pieces that, you know, the community is, is our hiring pool as well, and people need to know what it is that we do, and that if we do, if everybody's expectation is to do both domestic violence and sexual assault, that that's clear when we hire people and when we train people and that we train people around that. Absolutely, Michelle. Yep. Yep. And I will share just from a perspective of someone who's worked at a, a coalition in the past and who's done sort of, we had voluntary opportunities for folks to um, have an assessment, uh, evaluation and assessment that really had no merit. It was just a, an optional thing. And what we found at a lot of dual programs was that people did not want to do the sexual violence work because they did not see an immediate response. Mm -hmm. So with domestic violence, you know, you can provide someone a place to live. You can provide all these supports that are real and concrete and make a difference in their lives if they are choosing to seek those services. But with sexual assault, it's, it's much more sort of 
we can do those in that acute phase, but so often we don't see survivors in that acute phase. And we're seeing afterwards and we're doing our reflective listening and we're just sort of meeting them where they are and, and, and providing that kind of help, but it's not an immediate change and it's not concrete. Mm-hmm. Which, um, you know, Carla, is such a good example of how then, you know, having this, focus on sexual violence and understanding what sexual violence survivors needs affects yeah. it's like how we define success in our organization how we define what is effective in our organization is really dependent on our understanding of what sexual violence survivors need right because when we're organized to think that we're successful or um, right meeting the need is by giving this concrete sort of thing um, mm-hmm. then absolutely it makes it that much harder to feel like I'm doing a good job or I'm doing what I'm supposed to do by listening to someone and being present with them in their pain. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yep. And I think because, you know, we are all funded under VAWA and, and oftentimes mm-hmm. people link us, link our domestic violence and sexual violence as a similar crime. And oftentimes for survivors, both occur in their lives for sure. But the services that we provide to domestic violence survivors is very different than the services we provide to sexual violence survivors in a lot of ways. And I think we don't really talk about that skill building um, Mm -hmm. around sexual violence services. Yeah, I agree, Carla. And 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 sometimes maybe it's even like we don't necessarily value it because so much of it is that listening piece we don't value that emotional labor and are valuing more yeah. um, uh, things that are um, um, that have those outcomes, like you were saying, which is kind mm-hmm. of maybe inherent to capitalism. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's certainly to be kind to ourselves. To on the list. <laughs> yeah, to be kind to ourselves. This is hard work. All domestic violence advocacy, sexual violence advocacy, it's it's hard. And to be able to sort of check a box at the end of the day <laughs> can be a comfort. Um, but sort of, uh, but if we start kind of processing things in a different way and lifting up those, that ability to sort of be with a person and just, and, and reflective listening and all that other stuff, which is one of our biggest goals it's with Sadie, um, I think we can sort of, hopefully change that culture, or at least impact that culture, which I think would benefit domestic violence survivors as well. Any final thoughts, uh, Valerie or Carla, before we um, kind of wrap up today? I just want to say thank you for everyone's time and attention um, today. I know that it's very valuable, and I appreciate you being willing to to, to spend that um, time and attention with us today. And so just thank you. Yep, I would just mirror that thank you. Um, we uh, at Wixap really appreciate you both Um, being willing to share information with us today and really share your experiences of working on the Sexual Assault Demonstration Initiative. Um, I'm going to be sending out um, a final evaluation um, and your um, training um, kind of certificate, as it were. And I'll also send a link in that email to the um, Sexual Assault Demonstration Initiative final report that is much more, has much more information that you're free uh, to look at with also some shorter pages on, on, on some of the findings. So thank you all so much. Um, please make sure and take the evaluation. And you can e- email me, michelle, at wixap.org. If you have any further questions or, or any follow-up um, um, resources that, that you'd like um, that were mentioned today.